Okay, heads up, my creative brothers and sisters. Not Real Art now has an exclusive membership program designed just for you. If you're an artist or an art lover and you appreciate what we do here at Not Real Art and you'd like to join the family and help support the cause and celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it, please consider becoming a member today. Your membership will help support our work, such as funding our artist grant and production costs for all the programs and content we produce. Your membership will also help us stay independent and commercial free. And when you do become a member, you'll get valuable benefits and perks we think you'll find very cool. And becoming a member is super affordable. Just $5 a month for artists and $10 a month for art lovers. So to become a member of the Not Real Art family, simply go to notrealart.com, click on membership to sign up, and help us celebrate and elevate the creative culture we love and the artists who make it. Thank you. Warning, the Not Real Art Podcast is intended for creative audiences only. The Not Real Art Podcast celebrates creativity and creative culture worldwide. It contains material that is fresh, fun and inspiring and is not suitable for boring old art snobs. Now, let's get started and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, my creative brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast, where we celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it. I'm your host, Sourdough. My co-host, the esteemed Man One, is on assignment today. So it's just me here in the booth. But I want to thank you all for supporting us and continuing to listen. And we do this for you. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about our show today because the next couple of episodes over the next few weeks are going to be a little bit unique because on October 24th, we're the media sponsor for a show that uh, Crew West Studio, our mothership, is producing called Indivisible. And it's a political art exhibition that, like I said, we're producing and it's a great show going to be a great show. So definitely want you guys to check it out on October 24th when it goes live just by going to indivisible2020.org. But the whole reason we're doing Indivisible, which again is a political art exhibition, was to address stuff going on in our country right now. Obviously, it's been a hell of a year. And certainly after the murder of George Floyd, we, I think like everybody, were thinking about, well, what could we do to help make a difference or help address the conversation, add some value to the conversation, and be a positive voice in what has been a pretty challenging year. And it's only going to get more challenging over the next few weeks as we come into the election and depending on how things play out over the next few weeks and months as we sort out the votes and see who the legitimate winner of the presidential election is going to be. So anyway, we decided many weeks ago that we thought that given how divided the country is and divided people seem to be, that it would be interesting to curate a show that would address some of these issues. And so we asked our friend Karen Frito, who is a political artist, who's done some incredible work. She's got death threats for her work. She is on the front lines. No doubt, but Karen also happens to be a Not Real Art grant winner from 2019. And so we think of Karen as being kind of in the Not Real Art family as one of our grant recipients, which, by the way, if you're an artist listening and you haven't applied for a 2021 grant, be sure to do that. But Karen and I started talking about what we could do. She came up with this amazing idea for a show called Indivisible, sort of exploring what it means to be indivisible today. Many of us grew up stating the Pledge of Allegiance and saying that we're indivisible, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Turns out that's pretty aspirational. We've always been very divided and we're still divided today more than ever, it seems. And so we thought it'd be great to have a show that we could have some great artists come together and explore what indivisible means these days, what it means to be divided, what it means to be united in this country today and even around the world. And so uh, Karen has been 
a great partner and has been curating this show. She's been working with us and our partners at Sugar Press Art to curate, I think, what is going to be an incredible show. We've got some incredible artists, Andrea Rejo, Linda Leike, Gabe Galt, Edward Culver, John Mark Edwards, Kaylin Campbell, Kay Brown, Man One, Leroy Johnson, Ted Meyer, Aaron Yoshi, Miles Regis, Anna Stump, Linda Vallejo, and Meredith Vandenberg, who are all going to be in the show. So Karen's been doing this great job of curating. We've got some amazing artists. And Sugar Press has been an incredible partner. They're going to be creating prints around much of the art in the show that you can buy. And as part of the show, we thought it would be great to have the artists on the podcast as guests to talk about their work, talk about the show, just talk about the state of our union. And so the next few episodes of the podcast are going to be conversations with these artists. And all these conversations were done remotely over the interweb. And so it was technically challenging at times, but we were able to pull it off. And so we've got Leroy Johnson coming up. We've got Linda Vallejo, Man One. We've got Mary Sherwood Brock, Joshua Waddles, Karen Ferrito, Ted Meyer, Aaron Yoshi, Kaylin Campbell, all who are going to be guests on the show. And so we're thrilled about that and want to continue to promote this show. The show is going to hang virtually until the inauguration. So you'll be able to go to indivisible2020.org to access the show and look at the art and experience the art. But we're going to have a Zoom reception opening on October 24th. So if you're hearing this before October 24th, please come to our opening Zoom reception that evening where you can hear from our artists and ask questions, so on and so forth. But like I said, the art itself, the exhibition itself will hang until the inauguration. And oh, by the way, we want to make the Indivisible show an annual event because this is a ongoing conversation. Certainly building unity in this country is a long-term project that we're fully aware that one show is not going to solve our problems. We need to keep having these conversations. We need to keep speaking truth to power and challenging people to think more broadly and more deeply about these issues. And so Indivisible is a show that we hope to do year over year. This is our first year, Indivisible 2020. So Definitely go to indivisible2020.org and check out the show. I want to shout out to Karen Ferrito, who has been curating the show. She's been doing a powerful, amazing, incredible job. I want to shout out to Sugar Press Art, one of our key sponsors in putting the show together. Many of their artists are featured in the show. And then, of course, Not Real Art is the media sponsor. So you'll be hearing from us about the show moving forward. So definitely check it out. On today's episode, we hear from indivisible artists Anna Stump, Ted Meyer, Aaron Yoshi, and Kaylin Campbell. And this episode was a fun one. We really crammed it in because Anna and Ted are partners and they were on one channel together, and Aaron was on her own channel, and Kaylin was on his own channel, and I was on mine. So Doing this over the internet was a little bit tricky at times. Hopefully, you guys can hear everyone all right. But it was action-packed, a lot to say. These artists are incredible, of course, very activist-minded and politically oriented in their work and their contributions to the indivisible online virtual exhibition happening October 24th is incredible. So I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. And without further ado, let's get into it with Anna Stump, Ted Meyer, Aaron Yoshi, and Kaylin Campbell. Ted Meyer, Anna Stump, Aaron Yoshi, Kaylin Campbell, welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast. Thank you for having having me. Great to have you here. We're all coming together today because you all are exhibiting in our upcoming virtual art exhibition 
in this COVID age, it has to be virtual now, right? Unfortunately. But we have a political art exhibition happening called Indivisible, which all of you are participating in. We're so grateful that Karen Ferrito brought us all together. And here we are. And so I want to start the conversation just with a broad question. We feel so divided these days as a country. Maybe we've always been divided as a country, practically speaking. The show is called Indivisible. Anna, let's start with you. When you think about what it means to be indivisible in America today and the work that you're submitting to this show, I mean, what comes to mind? What does indivisible mean to you? For me right now, that would be something that seems pretty far from reality. We are living since the beginning of the pandemic in a very red area and it's rural. It's rural America and it's a shock to us, both being coming from the cities and we live right next to a Marine base. So we see a lot of support for the president here and it's hard for us to be here. Sorry not to offend anybody if you're of the other persuasion, but it's hard for us being very much not on that side of the political spectrum. So for me, indivisible seems like something really difficult to handle. Now, just for our listeners' sake, just to be really clear, where exactly are you living right now? We are in 29 Palms, which is in the high desert right outside Joshua Tree National Park. So it's San Bernardino County, desert. Right. So, and that's typical, right? So many rural areas tend to be more conservative. And so you're there sort of holding the liberal flag in a very red, red area. We are not holding the liberal flag out here. That would be like getting yourself shot. (laughs) <laughs> You're that concerned? Yes. Are you? We are not advertising our political views. It's an interesting town because there's a lot of artists out here. A lot of people have moved out from L.A. But the underlying part of the city is the military base. A lot of people stay here after they're done in the military. So I think we've seen one Biden lawn sign, but there are many Trump flags. There's QAnon stickers on cars. So it's a different world from us than the liberal art community we had in Los Angeles. We have a Trumpville store right down the street from us. Wow. Interesting. Wow. A retail store dedicated to Trump all paraphernalia. Trump. It says all things Trump on the window. Right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, freedom of speech or something. I don't know. Aaron, how are you feeling about Indivisible? What does Indivisible mean to you? To me, it sounds like what needs to happen in the future. I mean, I live many years in the Bay Area where it's super integrated. Most of my community is pretty multicultural. And I really see in so many ways we do come together. But, you know, I also now live in L.A. and L.A. is very segregated still. And so I understand as well. I feel like my community, I'm on the east side, is pretty conservative and it's very different from the communities I've lived in in the past. So I can understand in a lot of ways, but I think it's really where the future is going. So many more people are multicultural. So many communities need solidarity and work together. And a lot of the folks that I've been organizing with and building with over the years, I really feel like that's what we've really been pushing for is to take it to that level where we see each other, we see the humanity, we understand each other's histories, and we really want to learn from each other. We try not to do like the oppression Olympics where it's like mine is worse than yours, yours is worse than mine, but we really want to understand what is the history that has been hidden from us that isn't in our school books. And I think that is really what's brought us so closer together. So I'm hopeful for the future, but right now I feel like things are very dire. Interesting. Interesting. Kaylin Campbell, what say you about this aspirational notion of indivisibility? Well, I think there are times that we've been divisible as one, but this is not one of those times. And for it to happen now at this time and age, 2020, it's just mind blowing to me because America is a melting pot. All these cultures have come together to create what we are, and now we're dividing that. That really doesn't make a lot of sense to me right now how people can be on board with splitting the country the way that it's being split. And more than ever, we need to pull that together. We need to pull everybody together. And I don't know what's going to do that, but something's going to wake people up. And if it starts with art, then it starts with art, but it's got to start somewhere. What art have you been seeing that's been inspiring to you in terms of 
helping to facilitate a conversation or help to make positive change? Has there been an artwork or an artist that has been speaking to you lately? Well, all the murals that came out of the Black Lives Matter, there's been some incredible work in that. And you can feel the emotion in the work. And that's what makes good art. When you drive by some of these murals that just popped up, and nobody put money down and said, come paint a mural for me, and said, Black Lives Matter. It's from the heart. And when you see that, it kind of feeds my own art because it excites me to see that level of people coming together on that kind of the ground force, you know, and building from the ashes kind of thing. And we haven't seen too much of that in the last probably 20 years. At least I haven't. In terms of art, it's been homogenized for a long time. Now we're getting back to where the culture has become politicalized. And once the culture becomes politicalized, then you get that feedback from the people, and that's what feeds the culture. So it's all intertwined, and I see that happening in art now, especially with the murals. and Ted. Well, Ted, this idea of other, mm-hmm. where does this come from? How did this come to be, this idea of other? Not that I agree with this as a social construct, but I think there's always been another. I mean, tribes that were tight survived better. Evolutionarily, if you were in a tribe that was tight, or or there's a lot of belief that religions were a way for people to survive, because if you had similar thought process, you could survive an outside attack from another tribe. The world's always been tribal. Look at World War I, look at the history of Europe and all the tribal fighting in Africa. I mean, I think the United States is so unique because we were, to take Reagan's word, that shining city on the hill that fought that belief that tribalism should triumph. And I travel a lot. I get to go around the world a lot for work, and I've always traveled. I see a lot of problems in the United States, but I was always very proud of being an American when I went around. I mean, there's times when I would travel and people would yell at me because they didn't like Bush or they didn't like this or or that. But on the whole, I always felt like we were a country that was accepting. We're always working toward a better goal of being more inclusive. And now, almost to the point of immobility some days, I don't feel that way. And it's very depressing to me. So I'm sort of going the opposite of your question. The United States is always referred to as the great experiment. And right now, I think we're failing. And I think if we don't maintain and sustain it, there's no real help for the rest of the world to ever achieve it. Good point. Aaron, what would you add to that? Well, your question about like the art that inspires right now, I'm really into poster making art. Like I really feel like this last couple of years is the time of handmade signs. And I really love some of the posters that are coming out of just regular people who don't consider themselves artists that are just putting their heartfelt messages on paper with whatever tools they have at home. I mean, I feel like that sometimes has been really moving. And definitely the murals on the street as well. I feel like it's great because it's a spontaneous reaction that comes naturally. And I feel like it's super democratic. This is what people feel. They go out and they paint it. Like you said, there's no money behind it. It's not because they're doing it necessarily for the fame. They're doing it to make a statement. So I agree. I think it's really a renaissance period for political art. And the other thing is like one of my crewmates, her name is Nancy Peely. She was one of the people that hung the resist banner over the White House. You know, she climbed up that 300 feet and hung that banner with Greenpeace. And really when that exploded, it was incredibly inspiring. We were text messaging while she was up there and I'm like, dude, get off your phone. You know, (laughs) that's very dangerous. But it was incredibly moving to see people risking their butts. I think one of the women from the boards of Greenpeace, she was like, I think she was in her late 60s. She climbed up 100 feet. I mean, it was just incredibly inspiring to see people not only putting their heartfelt messages, but risking their own necks, their butts to climb up that high. So I feel like in those ways, it's such an inspiring time. And it really just pushes, I think, me to think deeper, to go harder and to be more clear with my messaging. Well, Kaylin, are you able to find hope? Where are you finding hope these days? It seems that many of us, myself included, we're stressed, we're angry, we're so many things to feel pessimistic about. Where are you finding hope? Are you able to find hope? 
I know it seems like a real hopeless time because it never ends. It's like the one thing after the other after the other. And it's like this domino effect. And it's hard to catch your breath when each domino is so encompassing the pandemic and what's going on politically. There's just so much. And the economy for an artist is very, very hard to, to deal with right now for me because I've lost so many clients. And so I've been feeling a hopelessness that's kind of underlying. But on top of that is my, is I do have hope. I mean, I'm going, I, I keep going. I'm here, I'm making art, I'm still out there. So there has got to be a spark in there somewhere. I'm starting to feel more and more hope with what's, like with the presidential debate, I think that more and more people are realizing what a buffoon he is. I don't know how everyone else feels, but yeah, I'm anti-Trump. So that gives me a little bit of hope. But then again, I had hope for the election last time that he wouldn't be put in. So it's just an unknown time. And that's what I feel. I feel that unknown. It's just kind of filled me. We just have to push on, keep on keeping on, as they say. Do what we do and hopefully make some kind of a difference. Yeah. Anna? I think that having hope you have to sort of trick yourself into it. And especially if you have kids. I mean, I have two sons who they're young men now, and I just have to have hope for them. And we're older, you know, we messed up the world. And I just hope that generation, which I really admire, I think those kids that Gen Z, they are highly idealistic, they're action oriented, they're smart. And I feel like I have hope for them. I want the world to be better for them. And I also think that they're going to solve a lot of the problems that we've created. So, and it's up and down. Some days you feel so bad and some days you feel, okay, something's going to change. Maybe this pandemic is causing very, very profound changes, which we can't feel yet. And those are necessary changes. I hope that that's true. Changes in class structures and things like that. So We just have to keep hope alive. You mentioned your sons. Are they over 18? Are they able to vote? Yep. They are. 19 and 23. One of my worries is the younger generation who were maybe very pro-Bernie or Elizabeth Warren or what have you, and we ended up with Joe Biden, which I'm going to vote for him, but he's just an old white dude, legacy politician. He's not an innovator. He's not an exciting human being, really. I think he's a good man. I'm going to vote for him. But I worry that the younger voters may not come out because it's not Bernie. It's not Elizabeth Warren, these kind of revolutionary kinds of liberal candidates. What are you hearing from your sons and from maybe their friends and anybody who are in touch with Gen Z and the younger generation? Are they going to come out? Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. My older son is extremely political and he was much more to the left and would have preferred Bernie, but now he's full on board. I mean, we'd vote for a cabbage at this point over the president. (laughs) Yeah, I agree with that. I think people get that a vote for Biden is not for Biden or for Kamala. It really is a vote against Trump. So, you know, a lot of people are seeing it as like, it's kind of like our little smack in the face to Trump to say like, I will go and vote for you just to let you know that people don't agree with your politics. Because I think sometimes the presidents really speak to the norm language or a norm of what's going on in the US. They kind of set the tone. And so by us going out and voting, it really is a statement against that. And, you know, he's just popularized this racist rhetoric so much that I feel like people feel emboldened to be able to be that way. And I think that our generation gets, I'm kind of in the in-between. I'm not that young. I'm kind of in the middle. But I do feel like I get the sense that people understand it's not for Biden, it's against Trump. And I also think that the younger generation was very thrilled when they felt that their TikTok thing about signing up for his rally, they were thrilled with that. They were like, we brought him down. Whether it was true or not, they loved that. So that was a great thing. Maybe something else will happen like that, which gives them like power that they can almost measure and feel that excitement of. When I hear people who, like, I'm not voting because I'm not excited about anybody, the thought of losing democratic institutions is not enough to get you excited, at least enough, to mail in a ballot ahead of time. I have no respect for people at the moment who will not take a stand on this. This is an existential threat 
to the world and certainly the United States. And if we don't, depending on the outcome of this election, we might, I mean, they have elections in Russia and look what happened. Putin is now running the place until 2038. And that's what's going to happen here. Step by step, you get the judicial and then you get bar and all these people that are yes people. And eventually it's all gone. And if that is not enough to get people excited enough to at least, like you were saying, cast against Trump. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting on so many levels. I mean, I'm reminded of that old phrase, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Yeah. Right. And I've always loved that because it sort of speaks to the challenge of democracy. I mean, part of why people get frustrated and maybe why young people feel like nothing's going to change. I'm not going to vote. I'm not is because it's slow, right? If you're having a democracy, right, you're supposed to be able to debate issues and work that process and get to a common resolve that is hopefully for the mutually benefit of the country. Change is slow. And I can see, you know, these kids are growing up with instant gratification, instant communications, instant satisfaction on demand, push button this, delivery that. The government can feel moves at a glacial pace, I can see how that would be frustrating for them. It's not moving fast enough. I would say too, I used to live in Ecuador and within one presidency, there was a social democratic president, Correa, and change can happen very fast. It doesn't necessarily have to be slow. And within that one presidency, they decided to nationalize oil. So oil was no longer something that could be private where families would benefit, but it was considered a government and public trust so that the money then the profits made from the oil industry went back to pay taxes and pay for social services. So they brought in universal health care. They built new roads. They made universal education where some of the private schools started to shut because all the teachers started teaching at public schools because they were paying so well. So it was a major transformation within one presidency. So I would say like, I totally understand why people don't want to vote because I don't feel inspired either. I completely get it. And like I said, like my vote is much more a slap against Trump than anything for Biden. And I think that part of what people feel in their frustration is that the Democratic Party doesn't get it. They're picking candidates that are very centrist. And he's even to the right of center. Biden is to the right of center. He's very establishment. So nobody feels inspired. And if you want a base to not be inspired and to not go out and vote, then pick somebody center like they did with Hillary. So I feel like I understand why people feel frustrated, but I agree with you. People need to go vote. And even though it pains me to put a vote for Biden, I'm still going to do it because it terrifies me if Trump is a president again. I just think you're simplifying to go the Democrats chose this person. I mean, Biden did win the primaries and we both would have liked a different outcome of that too, but that is who it landed up being. So it may be as exciting as Bernie is to a lot of people or some of the younger candidates. The majority of people, for whatever reason, turned to Biden. Maybe it was that safety net when you see Trump screaming and yelling. I don't know. He was my last choice of everybody running, but for some reason, he got the majority of votes. So I'm going to vote for him. So I don't know. Right. I mean, I think that The Democratic establishment really got behind him. So after the first couple debates, when everybody dropped out and all of a sudden it was just the two of them, I felt like that was such a strategic maneuver by the Democratic establishment to make sure people kind of got in line so that their candidate would go forward. And I feel like we saw it with Hillary, how they were trying to basically push her to the front by giving her advantages where they really put Bernie at a disadvantage. So I think that it's actually a very strategic maneuver that they did that was planned and executed to what they were strategizing against. So I don't at all think it's simple. I think that that was a paid strategy that people had meetings over and they were really, really, really trying to make sure that the establishment or the status quo didn't shift too much because it almost felt like, at least to me, and this is my personal feeling, it felt like they would rather have Trump that have Bernie, because they would rather have people not vote, like so many young people and next generation not vote, that it was like, they're so fearful of that change and what that could be. I can also tell you, as we are older than you, there are a lot of people our age who supported Bernie, but there were also a lot of people our age who tend to vote in much higher percentages that were scared of Bernie. We were not one of them. We were supporters. 
But if you lose the older people who tend to vote at like a 50 or 60 percent level as compared to losing the college kids who vote at a 15 percent level. So you might be right. It might have been a very strategic thing to hold on to our age group because we're more likely to turn out. So I was just interested to hear what you were talking about. Did you say Ecuador? Where were you? Where it changed? I in was Ecuador? in Quito. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's great. I love Ecuador. I was living in Turkey when Erdogan first came into power, and I saw the opposite happen. A mm -hmm. democracy, a mm -hmm. young democracy that had its problems, lose it. And half the people mm -hmm. fought against it, and they did everything. They tried to do a coup. And my friends are devastated. They know what's happened. They're smart. They're educated. They lost their democracy. And that guy is awful. So I get scared that that's happening here. Absolutely. Well, so earlier I asked, where are we finding hope? And one of the areas that I'm finding hope, a couple of areas, if I could share, <laughs> is, well, A, I have hope long term because the demographics of this country is changing. And they can't stop it. And they're scared as hell. Like, that's why I feel like they're doing everything they can, right, to hedge against this inevitable change. And so I have hope. It gives me hope knowing that the demographics of this country are changing and inevitably this diversity and this richness will be realized. And so that gives me hope. But that's more long term. Short term, it's interesting. There's so much angst around this mail-in voting. Voter suppression is real. We know that it happens. But this is the first election that I'm aware of, I think it's safe to say, first election where they're trying to now get ballots in the hands of virtually every citizen that can vote because mail-in ballots were an option, right? You chose to do that. It was a very kind of a rare thing. I'm hoping that this now mass mail-in voting becomes a normal thing. And it feels like this first one's going to be challenging, no doubt, for all kinds of reasons. But hopefully, over time, we'll see more of this and it would grow. Wouldn't it be great if everybody was just mailing in their votes? Except like today, the governor of Texas signed a law that they are only going to have one drop box for ballots per county in Texas. He limited the number of drop boxes to one per county. So that means people will have to drive hours sometimes to vote. So they are not making it easy. Well, we know Texas is going for Trump anyway. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't know. These are unprecedented times. I think if they're going to that extent, though, to keep people from voting, I'm not sure it is going to go to Trump. A lot of the polls show Texas in play at the moment, remarkably. And Richards was governor once in the before times. Yeah, Texas is his own animal. Texas is unique. Yeah. I mean, I feel like all the maneuvers that they're doing to gerrymander and to make it so difficult for people to vote by changing some of the courts in Florida, for instance, with folks that were starting to be able to vote, I think it's really a sign of the changing of times that they're afraid that we are going to vote, that people are going to show up, they're going to speak their voice, and they're going to lose. And so they are trying every sort of trick and maneuver to get out. And I also think that that's representative of the time. They are super scared that people are going to show up and they're going to be out. So in some ways, though it infuriates me, I think it's also kind of hopeful too, which sounds very strange because it shows the times are changing and that people are waking up, they're getting involved and they are going to try and make their voice be heard. So yeah, I think the other thing about hope, just to touch on that too, I feel like if you feel hopeless, it's actually a really good sign because it's totally hopeless right now. There's so many things that are wrong. It's like we're totally paying attention and that we feel what's going on around us. And I think the more that we accept that if we feel life is overwhelming and crazy, it's because we're completely being aware of our moment. Like that to me is also very hopeful because it shows that we're engaged, we pay attention to what's going on and that it's gonna cause more people to react and make movements. So even though I feel completely overwhelmed by the world, I was in the bay with the orange sky a couple weeks ago and I really felt like the world was coming to an end. It actually made me feel very hopeful to talk to other people who also felt like, oh man, we need to make some changes because our world is dying right now. We just had a success out here, just really briefly. The Joshua tree was temporarily marked as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. And that was really hopeful. And I think that a lot of artists had a big influence on that decision. 
because there was so much artwork and photography and filmmaking and activism about people trying to get that tree protected. So that's also hopeful. Kaylin, what about in terms of being indivisible, that's aspirational on many levels, but also our founding fathers talked about the importance and the need to separate church and state. To what extent does the separation of church and state or lack thereof create this situation that we're in? Well, that's a good question, especially with the president we have now, where everything is tied together. I personally, I do my own thing spiritually. I see like a church type of situation for myself. And therefore, it's hard for me to comprehend the people that are trying to put it all into one block that the Republicans are doing. And I think it is dividing us. The very thing that's supposedly bringing people together because we're all spiritual creatures and it's actually dividing more and more people because you aren't like me, go to this church, you don't think like this. It's dividing more people and it's the same thing. It's the same entity that's saying, we're all one, we're all people, we're all souls. It's just hypocritical. And I, I myself see it happening more and more with the Republicans where they're trying to intertwine too. But like you said, the founding fathers said that it separates the two and that's how it should be. We all should have our own spiritual deities that we want. That shouldn't come into play like stepping on other people in terms of the politics of the city or the town or the village. I have to agree that it should be separate. Well, the one issue that seems to drive it is Roe v. Wade, a woman's right to choose. It seems like that is the hot button issue that mitigates the separation of church and state. Whether you're Catholic or Christian or whatever you are, this idea that a woman should have the right to choose quickly gets distilled down to murder. What's going to happen with this? We'll go back to the states. And like before, you'll have certain states where people won't be able to get services and they're going to have to come to either coast or Illinois or somewhere where you're still able to get prenatal services or abortion, whatever you need. I mean, this is what I don't understand about the conservatives. They love every child until it's born, and then they could give a shit about it as far as funding for lunches and schools and breakfasts and making sure. I don't understand this idea of, of every life counts until we have to pay for it and it can walk. It just drives me nuts. On a can speak to this way better than me. I'll just give you my guy view. But it's not just abortion. Once you start telling women they can't do that, it's a slippery slope. And I was going to say, Anna can also talk about what happens when one religion starts to take over, having been in Turkey. I can't get into that can of worms. But it's really interesting. I used to think of myself as like, if I had one issue that was important to me, it was a woman's right to choose. And now with this court problem, I almost think, okay, just set that aside. It's so much bigger than a woman's right to choose at this point with that conservative of a court. I just never thought that I would get to that point for me. I'd be like, I'm going to march in the streets and burn everything down if a woman doesn't have a right to choose. And now I'm like, oh God, that's not the most important thing right now anymore with this judge. So I'm just hoping that what happens with all judges, well, not all, but a lot of conservative judges tend to move towards the liberals. And I'm hoping that that happens with these people that are on there for so long. Yeah, I feel like Roe v. Wade is like a way to try and take away the progression of women, you know, that it's just another step to try and move forward in patriarchy and keep women down, I feel like, because I really see times are changing. Like they have that shirt or the slogan, the future's female. I'm very like the future's matriarchy. Women, we're stepping up and we're finding our voices and we take leadership roles and we lead in very democratic, equitable ways. I think in so many ways, because we naturally are like mothers and nurturers and we try and think about the impacts of community. So I think that that is terrifying for men and white men. I feel like that's terrifying to think that women and women of color are going to step up and have a voice and have a say and are smart and they could be leaders in the future. And so I think that it's just one way to chip away at us. But, you know, I know women right now who've driven across states to get abortions for things that were medical reasons that weren't because they didn't want to have a child. It was just they didn't even have access to it. And so I think that it's just another way. Same thing with pay equity. There's so many issues. And like you said, there's so many things that are wrong right now. It's almost like you have to pick and choose 
what you are super down for because if you care about everything you're like overly exhausted by all the issues so Roe v. Wade is super important. I feel like it's crucial for women. But at the same time, I agree there's so many issues right now that we are like carrying so many flags and banners at the same time. Yeah, because politics aside, we also have a climate that is in crisis. Pandemics are real. You know, we've been dodging pandemics for the last 10 years, so to speak, whether it was swine flu or H1N1 or whatever, you know, Ebola, COVID broke out and we've been wrestling with it all year. But even if our politics were in line, we have this climate issue that is so pressing. California is burning as we speak. Aaron, you mentioned the orange sky in San Francisco. Take us through that. I mean, tell us about your experience in San Francisco, because we all saw that image. It was apocalyptic. It felt like the world was ending. I woke up too early. It was still nighttime, but it was nine o'clock and it felt like it was night. And it was just the scariest, most eerie feeling where it was really probably the first time where I felt like, oh yeah, our planet's dying. You know, I knew it, but I really felt like, oh, it's, I mean, not even dying in the sense the planet will be here, but whether it's habitable or not for humans, it's just not looking very good in our favor right now. And it felt that way. It was a clear sign. So I think everybody that saw it felt that. And then the smoke that came in a few days later was just overwhelming. You couldn't be outside. And then I came back here and my parents are like on the verge of being evacuated because they're in LA fires. And so, you know, it's just the realization that climate change has already begun. Well, Anna and Ted, you guys live in the desert. Well, first of all, how many years have you lived in the desert? And to what extent have you seen the climate change there, the impact of climate change? We just bought our place two years ago, but we moved here full time when the pandemic hit because we felt that we would be safer in the rural area, which I feel we have been. So we haven't experienced it over a long period of time, but our property itself was built in 1930 and it was a dairy farm, a dairy farm. So you got to imagine cows and cows eat grass and there were 160 acres and there were crops here. And fruit trees. And fruit trees. It was in August, multiple days, we had 120 degrees here in 29 Palms. So there has been tremendous climate change just in 90 years. It's just crazy. Kaylin, how has climate change impacted you personally? Oh, when I moved here 10 years ago, I'm in the valley now near Los Angeles. 10 years ago, it never really broke 100 during the summer. And yesterday, my thermometer said that in the sun in front of my place was 118, and we don't have air. None of the units have air conditioning. It's 118 outside. It hits 94 to 97 inside. It's brutal. And all that's just within the last few years. Up until three years ago, I could make it through a summer. It would be hot, but it never went over 100. And not only that, but my friends live in Florida. They've seen these storms that normally they come through every year. They get the hurricanes. Now they're like super hurricanes. And now they're zombie hurricanes where a hurricane comes through, it dies down, it comes back again. That's all climate change that's happening. And it's not just me, it's like everywhere. And it's just amazing to me that the government's not doing more to try to reverse it. And and I think that that's where the younger generation is going to come in because they are inheriting all this and they're going to make the changes. They're going to say enough is enough because there are in large enough numbers now that they're going to be vocal about this because this is something that they can't get away from. Like politics, you can close your eyes to an extent. It's still going to affect you, but you can close your eyes. You can't close your eyes to when it's this hot everywhere and storms and just all that's happening with climate change. There's just no escaping. And if it keeps going this way, the younger generation realizes man has nowhere to go. There's nowhere to run from. That's why I think that they were right about the younger generation being the future voice for sure. They have to be. Yeah, the hypocrisy of our government, because as I understand it, our military branches are preparing for a rising sea. They are re-engineering their bases and moving equipment and troops and what have you to deal with this inevitable change. And yet our military lives in the real world and our politicians, uh, of course, get to play smoke and mirrors 
and cater to special interests. You know, one of the stories that I've been telling just in recent days about climate change for my life. So my wife and I last year finally decided to just very unique opportunity came up and we had fantasized about having a holiday home for a long time. But last year we finally took the plunge and bought this place up near Mammoth. And we happened to buy it from our friends who had built it and lived there for 12 years. And they called us last year and they asked us if we wanted to buy it, they were going to sell. And so we did, and we've been quarantining there since March. But with the fires this year, we've been under a red flag alert the last six weeks, which, you know, red flag is have your car packed, ready to evacuate at a moment's notice, right? We've been under red flag alert maybe 12 times in the last six weeks. Our friends, I asked our friends of the 12 years that you lived here, how many times were you under red flag alert? And they said once. (laughs) And boy, oh boy, that's just so telling. And the other thing is that, you know, I moved to LA in 01 from Chicago, from the Midwest, And I grew up with bugs. I grew up with mosquitoes. One of the things that I loved about LA when I moved here, there were no bugs. There were no mosquitoes. And boy, oh boy, has that changed. Erin's shaking her head. Are you dealing with the mosquitoes over there, Erin? Well, they love me. I'm like my husband's mosquito repellent. They don't touch him. They all come to me. So I think I just, I'm like that bright light that they just come to invite. So yeah, I totally feel you, but. Yeah, like even humidity. It was never humid when I grew up in LA. And now to feel this strange humidity, we never had. But it's like there's so many things I'd never heard of before, like the slow hurricane that just came and hit the South. Like, what is that? Dumping buckets where they're measuring it by feet and not inches. I was like, that sounds terrible. I was like, if somebody tells me that an asteroid's about to hit the planet, I'm going to totally believe it because so many things are going wrong with it. It's like, sure. Why not throw that on on top of it? You know, it just seems like the world is a pretty crazy place. We have sort of the opposite here. The first year we were here, there were bugs everywhere. And this year we had like these big beetles and scorpions everywhere. And you see a few things now. There's also this fever that's killed off most of the rabbits. We, a couple months ago, we had rabbits all over the property. And now if we see one a day, that's so. You guys might be getting more bugs, but it almost seems like they just aren't here. It's really creepy to be in the desert and not be infested with these crazy, weird beetles and things that show up in your house sometimes. Yeah, that could speak to extinction, right? Which is about the collapse of the ecosystem. And we need that biodiversity to have a healthy planet. Biodiversity on all levels, right? And this idea of being indivisible, like... The truth of the matter is we are indivisible and we're united because we're a species that lives on this one planet. We're all connected. And every choice that we make or that gets made for us has these consequences. And it feels like the biosphere, whether it's species, bugs, or whether it's people being segregated out or discriminated against, it's all toxic for our sustainability. Maybe the pandemic in certain ways can be helpful for this because it's very hard for politicians to say, well, to deal with climate change, everybody's standard of living is going to have to go down a little bit. But that is the truth. Except for, you know, the poorest of the poor, who can't go down much further. Everybody is going to have to go do less, buy less, travel less. And that's what the pandemic has forced us to do. And so I'm hoping that maybe we can realize, well, those things that we've lost, maybe they're not so important. The being together, that's been extremely hurtful that we can't do that. But can we drive less, fly less, buy less, eat less? Can we do everything a little less to save the planet? And I think that that's what we're doing. And I'm hoping that we're learning that lesson. Ted thinks everybody's just going to go I have, right I have no <laughs> faith in that. I think the second the airlines say it's safe to fly, the skies are going to be full of pollutants again, and Venice is going to be overrun with tourists. I have seen nothing in my 62 years that show that humans have any ability to think long term. I just don't see it. We evolved for immediate, if we see a snake, we know to panic and run away. 
But if we see the end of the world coming in a hundred years, it's not that important. It's a hundred years away. I don't know. I don't understand not taking things seriously, but apparently it's in our genes as a species. Well, that kind of begs the question a little bit. What's the problem? What's the real problem? Capitalism or people? Yes. <laughs> I think a lot of it has to do with, yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, but I think a lot of it has to do with priorities and the spin. I feel like we are in the age of spin. There's so many distractions and so many lies that are told on TV and told on mainstream media that we're really not focusing on the issues. Like everybody's talking about the pandemic, but we're not really talking about why do we have pandemics? Why is the pandemic even existing now more so than ever? Why are we going to have more pandemics in the future? Because we're living so much closer. We've deforested so many lands. We live closer to animal species that carry these bacteria that we're not accustomed to. We have to get down to so much more of the root issues. And because of the spin and talking about the tweet that happened that Donald Trump went out and that's on the news all day and not talking about the real issues, I feel like that's the distraction is what gets in the way. Because I think generally, I'm very hopeful in so many ways. I get that. But I do feel like so much innovation has happened. I mean, when you look at Los Angeles used to have this very robust public transportation, and it was dismantled by the car industries because it was a capitalist interest. But there was potential here for us to pollute less. And I feel like in so many ways, so many countries and so many cities have that where people are biking more and it's more walker friendly. So I think that it is coming through a counterculture that's starting to really take form. And so I think that that's really exciting. I do see the potential in it, but I think it's what you said. We don't have a choice. If we keep going this way, we're screwed. And even if we stop today, there's a thing called the lag effect in climate change, where even if we stop today, we're still going to feel the effects of what we've already done to the planet for the next 20 years. So we don't even have 100 years. We maybe have 15, 10, and it's just going to keep getting worse up until that point. So I feel like we all have to make a shift now. We don't have a choice. Yeah. I think consumerism is going to spike. As soon as all this is over, people are going to just, it's kind of a release. And I think people are going to go out, they're going to spend money, they're going to do things that we haven't been able to do because we've been locked in. And then I think that spike is going to drop again because people, like you said, they realize the future is now. It's not 100 years from now. It's now. It's what's happening to us now. So after that spike, I think people will actually be more grounded, at least I'd like to believe, in terms of consumerism and depleting all of the resources. Yeah, Karl Marx said religion is the opiate of the masses. I feel like if he were alive today, he would say consumerism is the opiate of the masses. I feel like those high-def, big-screen TVs that people clamor for, just keep them hypnotized and brainwashed to not take action and to not feel hopeful. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Well, I want our show, Indivisible, to give people hope. I hope that it does. I mean, it's going to raise all kinds of issues and important conversations, some hopeful, some not so hopeful. And I'm so grateful that you guys are in the show. I want to hear from each of you about your work that you submitted. How were you feeling? What were you thinking? What do you hope people get from your contributions in the Indivisible exhibition? I kind of put a negative spin on mine, but I always do. I always look at the dark side. So mine has that feel of justice. Like when my piece, Justice is Justice without a holiday. So it's all the bad things that happen without justice. The same with inequality. For me, that's kind of like what I see. I see the darker side see the negative, see the dark. I don't necessarily revel in that. I don't believe that everything is like that. It's just I happen to want to reflect that. Maybe I'll make the viewer think a little bit deeper about the consequences within the ideas that I put out there, even on a negative aspect. It, I mean, I don't put it out there as like, this is a fun piece. No, it's a dark piece. So you don't get the idea of my idea of life is don't kill people or whatever. But I do represent a side of it that I think a lot of artists don't. They try to put more of a positive outlook on things, which is great. But personally, that's not what I do. So in my own pieces, that's I kind of just reflected who I am and what is the way I see life. The, the, the mm-hmm. I see. Great. Aaron, how about you? 
I just had to say, I wish that people could see you because with the skull behind you, with the brushes <laughs> coming out, it just seems so cool when you're talking about it being dark. And then this awesome skull that's holding your brushes behind you is like, it's awesome. So I wish that people could see it because that's really cool. <laughs> and then the poster behind you on the other side that says oh, caught yeah. fire. Oh my God, what caught fire? <laughs> that's from a, a movie from the 50s called The Day the Earth Caught Fire. And I watched it about six months ago for the first time in like years. And it was shocking to me about how it really is like that today. It's about these people that wake up and Earth has got closer to the sun. And the whole film is pretty much how they're trying to deal with that. But the ending is very bleak because there is no ending. They're headed for the sun. Everything is going to burn up, period. That's it. <laughs> I've had that up for quite a few years, but it's weird to actually see the world imitate art, <laughs> unfortunately. Aaron, tell us about what was on your mind as you thought about participating in our Indivisible exhibition. The piece that I submitted, it's called Seven Generations. It's based on a Haudenosaunee Native American principle about thinking seven generations into the future when you make major decisions in your life. And I really see that that's kind of something that the next generations and our generations need to be doing is to look back for more historical knowledge around how to live in harmony with the planet, how to live in harmony with each other. And so I've been really reflecting on what are ways that people used to do it and trying to highlight some of that thinking. And so I really love that ideal. It's really been embodied by now a lot of like environmental movements, but the idea of trying to make any decision seven generations into the future seems insane. Some of us can't even just do what are we doing tomorrow or this week or like next year? So to think that far into the future, I think is really powerful and something that I try and work towards. Right. And that gets back to Ted's point, right? About people thinking long-term or not being able to think long-term, which is so important for survival. Ted, what was on your mind as you thought about the show and the work that you submitted? So I submitted a piece called Band in Mississippi, which is an interracial couple sort of a Shigali take on this interracial couple in bed where the woman is very dark and the guy is white. And the whole idea that at certain points it was illegal to have affection for somebody that was a different race. So it's probably one of the more angelic paintings I've done. But then if you look at the painting and think that that sort of feeling was illegal at one point, that the government could come in and arrest you for marrying somebody of a different race. So that's what I put in. But it also, and Anna's heard me say this a lot, and it gets back to your indivisible idea. My feeling really is until the majority of people have mixed children, we're kind of screwed because people seem to be able to hate their generation. But I don't have children, but all my friends, they love their grandchildren no matter what. And I think once we get a couple generations in where people are not going to be able to hate their grandchildren because they're mixed or a different race, I see some hope there. But it's a very, it's, it gets back to your point of the seven generations. It could be a long time, but I think everyone should mix it up and have the <laughs> mixed grandchildren and maybe it'll make the grandparents a little less racist and condescending. Yeah, a gumbo, a good gumbo is really what uh, <laughs> could, <laughs> could solve. But what you're saying resonates with me personally, my children are both African-American. My wife and I adopted them. My wife is African-American. And it's been interesting watching my news feed on Facebook because my roots are from the Midwest. And many of the people that I'm somehow connected to on Facebook, of course, never left the Midwest. They tend to be very conservative. But many of them don't know that my children are African-American. But they, like me, we're friends on some level. And they might post something there were several times when somebody would post something that was incredibly insensitive or biased or ignorant, or just they thought they were in a silo talking. And then I would sort of respond. It's like, well, yeah, but if your children are non-white like mine, you might think differently. And this kind of is this interesting thing that happens where suddenly people just their head got twisted around because their reality got twisted. It was like, oh, wait, Scott's kids aren't white. Wait, I like Scott. I trust his judgment. And it was, to your point, it's just when you start knowing people as human beings, right? That's when the guard comes down and that's when the heart opens up. 
it seems. Anna, what was in your heart and mind as you thought about submitting to the show? I believe the piece that she chose was a painting that I have been doing out here. It's a military helicopter in the sky. It's actually a medevac, so it's evacuating people. And the sky is very apocalyptic. And so it's an environmental piece, but it's also really about this very threatening image of a military helicopter. And I feel both very scared about the power of the military, but also thankful that it's there in some ways. So it has to do with those things. And also I paint on reclaimed metal. So our place out here when we bought it was covered with trash. And I just could not put more objects into the world after putting that much into the dump. And so I just started painting on stuff I found out here, which is a tradition here in the desert. So it's also about reclaiming old pieces of structure that I can make into hopefully interesting things to say about the world. Found object art, right? I love that. I love that. Well, I am so grateful, Anna and Ted and Aaron and Kaylin, for your time and for your contributions to the show. When George Floyd was murdered and we were all in shock and depressed and devastated, and maybe we weren't in shock because we see the shit happen way too much. It seemed like many of us were loathe to get back to work or life and what could we do? We wanted to try to help. And for us, for me, with the podcast, with everything we're doing, I wanted to try to add something of goodness and value to the conversation. And when I thought about how I might use the podcast and how I might tap into the amazing network of artists that we know and have to try to add something positive to the conversation. That was when this idea of coming up with a political art show that Karen Frito would curate. She brought all you guys together here. And so I'm grateful that light is coming out of the dark around this, both in terms of the exhibition that will open on October 17th, as well as these amazing podcasts that we're recording this week. I think this is my fifth one, talking to all the artists and the richness and the intelligence and the humanity and the empathy that's coming from all the artists in these conversations has been hugely inspiring and rewarding for me. And so I'm grateful to you. And I think this is going to be fantastic. The show for our listeners will reinforce this many times, but it's going to open on October 17th. It is a virtual exhibition. We're going to keep it live until the inauguration. We hope to do this show year over year. We hope you'll come back and do it again with us next year. And we are going to have a Zoom reception, uh, I believe October 24th, where all the artists, you guys will be there. You will be able to speak to your work. We're inviting over 50,000 art lovers on our mailing list to come attend the show. So we hope that we'll have a great turnout for you all. But before we adjourn, because I want to be really respectful of your time, I'd love for you guys to share for our listeners where they can find you online to follow you on Instagram or to buy your work online. Anna, will you begin? Will you tell our listeners how they can find you online? Sure. I have a website, AnnaStump.com, and my Facebook and Instagram handle is AMStump, like AmStump. And if you are interested in looking at our place in the desert, we have a website for that. It's called DesertDairy.com. Ted? I am at TedMeyer.com and all other things on Ted Meyer Art, so Instagram and Twitter. Great. Erin, where can people find you online? I'm ErinYoshi.com and on social media, I'm at Erin Yoshi. Kaylin? I'm KaylinCampbell.com. The Kaylin is K-A-L-Y-N-N. I know it's a girl's spelling, but that's what my parents gave me. <laughs> but before we go, though, too, we've talked a lot about the show Indivisible, clearly. Is there anything else that you all are working on that you would like to shout out about so that our listeners are aware? Aaron, I know you have a very exciting project that you're working on. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So I'm working on a new series of murals that are about climate change and biocultural diversity. 
they're kicking off in LA. I actually start one in the next couple weeks. The project's called The Land of We. I'm so thankful to be in partnership with Not Real Art among a few other amazing partners and sponsors. So you can follow along at my website, erinyoshi.com, but I'm going to do a series of murals and billboards as well as some education online through social media, talking about the importance of cultural diversity and ecological diversity. Kaylin, how about yourself? What's coming up for you that our listeners should know about? I'm working on a project of art stamps based on a fictitious island that disappeared in the 1930s. And I'm hoping to get all that together and get a book out on that. And the information will be on my website once I get it a little further along. Great. Anna and Ted? Well, we have an artist residency out here, which has been shuttered because of the pandemic, but we are now constructing a separate safe environment for people to come out. So that's exciting to have people coming out again. And I had a show last month in 29 Palms and Ted has a show coming up. A couple of things. First, I'm always looking for artists that have medical illnesses that do work about their illnesses. I curate a lot of shows by patient artists as a way to explain to doctors what the human narrative of illness is. So if anybody would like to contact me about that, I would love to look at their work. I'm also in a show that's going to be at Liz's Loft in a couple weeks. And that was a show where actually this was where the painting I submitted for this show came from. It was called Skin Deep and it was done 10 years ago. And they're having a 10-year anniversary of that show. And we're each putting in one piece we'd done for that show. And that show was talking about where race relations was at that point. And now I'm doing a piece to go along with it, as everybody is. They're putting in one old piece and doing new ones. I mean, this is a whole other talk for another time, but I was really not sure what to say about race relations at this point, because I felt as a white guy, you know, I read a quote the other day that race relations isn't a black problem, it's a white problem because the white people are causing all the problems. And I just kept thinking, what can I put in all this? What can I put in this show without seeming like I'm too woke or too aware when I really don't have that experience? So I'm making a bunch of small pieces that are just text that sort of point out my privilege. Like they just have text on the things like, I don't need to worry about getting shot by a cop. No one assumes my hair is a political statement. Things like that, that just, I get the advantage of just being me and not being picked apart all the time. So that's going to be at Liz's Loft. I'm sure it'll be online. I think she's having an actual show that people can see too, although I'm not sure if there's going to be an opening. So anyway, I'm doing nine of those. So that was sort of very interesting because I had to really think as a white person, what can I say that doesn't make me sound like a schmuck? I love that. It's so clever, but subtle. And yeah, it's great. Thank you. Yeah. I grew up in an area where we were knucklehead kids and we got harassed by the cops. We didn't worry about getting shot or arrested ever. A little reprimand. Yeah. And I was thinking with your kids, you're going to have to have a whole different sense of what they can safely do as opposed to what you did. Most of the things are in the show. The woman I dated before Anna for almost a decade was African-American. And they were things that she would say, like, oh, I'm getting followed around the store. She was a doctor. She was very successful. So most of the things on this panel are things that we had discussed at some point or another on each of these individual panels. Well, I look forward to seeing that. And I am, again, so grateful for your time, guys. Thank you so much for sitting down and playing podcasts with us as we run up to our exhibition. Please be well, be safe, stay healthy and have a wonderful evening. Thanks again for your time. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. For nice to meet you. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode, write a review, and share with your friends on social. And if you haven't already done so, please press the subscribe button and follow us on Instagram at Not Real Art World. If you're an artist, be sure to apply for our 2021 artist grant at notrealart.com. Sourdough. Out.